A very warm welcome, everyone. My name is Kate Hayward, and I'm chair of the Lizard Island Reef Research Foundation. On behalf of my fellow trustees, I'd like to welcome you this evening and thank you for joining us. Um, it's a great pleasure to be hosting um, this webinar tonight. We're absolutely delighted with the response. We have over 160 registries and our audience this evening includes not only supporters and grantees of the station, um, the foundation, but um, a whole host of scientists, marine scientists, researchers, and uh, a wonderful uh, number of students themselves, students from around Australia who actually all are probably our next generation of marine scientists. I um, just want to give you some geographic context to start. I am sitting in the office of Professor Chris Helden um, at the Australian uh, Museum. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, and Anne and Lyle, who I hope you can see on your screen, are um, up on the tropical island of, of Lizard. Uh, they in fact, uh, did try and uh, drag their kit, their webinar kit, down to the lagoon um, to have a sort of a beautiful uh, moon moonrise for you all and literally have a reefside chat. But uh, uh, Telstra didn't quite extend there, and they're in their office there at uh, Lizard. I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of um, the, the land on which the museum stands, um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Jigaroo or Lizard, the Dingle people, and just acknowledge all elders past, present and emerging. Just a couple of housekeeping matters about this webinar. We expect it to run for 30 to 45 minutes. Um, it will be recorded. Uh, we will, uh, you will be able to access this, or your friends will if you're not with us tonight. Um, we really want to make it as interactive as possible. Um, we're really hoping that much of the discussion can be Q&A led. So um, I'm going to turn over to Chris in a minute. Um, we'll just speak, speak briefly and then to Anne. And then the second half, we really hope that you will um, uh, join in and it's a wonderful opportunity to engage directly with Anne and Lyle. And because there's so many of you, um, you're actually not able to speak, but you'll see on the little panel on the side of your, your, um, your computer, your laptops, uh, you can type in your questions, send them in, send them in any time, um, and please don't be shy to do so. Um, just a few words about the foundation. Um, it was established 40 years ago, um, and it basically exists to support the work at the station um, and elsewhere on the reef. Uh, we basically uh, fund fellowships and grants. We provide um, backup uh, for the facilities at the field station itself, and then also um, you know, provide support, not only for Australian researchers, but those from overseas as well. Um, since its founding um, 40 years ago, uh, the foundation has raised close to $12 million, much of that in the last 15 years. Um, at any one time, in any one year, we typically try and raise about half a million dollars, of which half of that goes to, to, um, to, to grants, to fellows, and the other half to, to infrastructure. Um, why is this so important? Well, you'll find out shortly. Um, now to our participants, Anne and Lyle, most of you, uh, many of you uh, beamed in tonight will know Anne and Lyle, they really need no introduction. Um, they're largely responsible for making the station the world-class facility that it in fact is. Um, they're the marine scientists that have um, basically um, stewarded this, um, this field station uh, so productively, efficiently um, over, the, over the last 30 years, in fact. Um, they've also uh, nurtured and supported the careers of many, many scientists. And uh, over the three decades, they themselves have observed many changes in the waters up around Lizard. Um, beside me now is Chris. Um, Chris, thank you for having me in your office. Uh, Chris joined uh, the museum in June this year, a very difficult time, I would imagine, to, to join when uh, everything was, was shut down. Uh, Chris comes with an incredible pedigree. He's, in fact, a mammalogist. Um, he worked from 2008 to 2017 as the mammalogist in chief at the Smithsonian, uh, the National Hist History Museum of Washington, D.C. He's a world renowned, um, world renowned in his field and also a passionate uh, commentator on um, biodiversity uh, conservation. So, um, 
I'm going to hand over to Chris now. He's just going to talk a little bit about his role uh, and how it relates to the station, and then he's going to introduce um, uh, Anne and Lyle. So please send in your questions anytime, because as I say, we really want this to be interactive later on. Chris, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much for welcoming all of us here tonight. And it's a pleasure uh, for me to host um, part of the gathering from the Australian Museum in Sydney here tonight as well as uh, being able to, in a moment, introduce you to uh, Dr. Ann Hoggett and Dr. Uh, Lyle Vale, who are there at uh, Lizard Isle. Um, I have had the chance to meet some of you already, but I might be new to most of you. So a few words uh, of background and introduction. I am the Australian Museum's uh, new chief scientist and director of our Australian Museum Research Institute. Uh, one very important branch of which is the Lizard Island Research Station, which brings us uh, together tonight. I'm absolutely thrilled to be in this role. My first visit to Australia almost 25 years ago from um, when I was a student at, at Harvard, an undergraduate student was uh, to try to meet Tim Flannery behind the scenes at the Australian Museum. And that was the first time I came here as a young researcher. Uh, and I've been uh, coming ever since. I did a PhD in Adelaide, the University of Adelaide, working in New Guinea and other areas of the tropical north. Uh, and um, then, as, as Kate mentioned, went on to be a scientist at the Smithsonian for about a decade before returning to Australia, a professorship at the University of Adelaide most recently, and then in June, uh, strange times as they are, uh, coming across here to the museum. So it's been... Um, uh, a full circle trip for me, uh, uh, coming here first uh, as a student and now arriving here in charge of science. And my role as chief scientist, I'm responsible for uh, our the collections, 22 million objects and specimens, um, our research programs of various kinds, and that includes the work that goes on at Lizard Island. Lizard Island Research Station uh, forms one of the most important backbones of our research on change through time. And uh, museums really are amongst research institutions uh, epicenters for understanding how the world is changing. And that's in part because of our role that we've always played in science of squirreling away uh, things behind the scenes in cabinets and jars with good data associated with them. Who collected this and when? Uh, what expedition is this from? Um, you know, this, this is, say, from 1880 on Lizard Island, perhaps. We can't get in a time machine and go back there, um, but we can have access to that object. And now that kind of work takes on uh, new life and new meaning in the last few decades as we've had uh, the physical presence of the Lizard Island Research Station out on the Great Barrier Reef, one of um, the most important uh, centers of research uh, there. The world is changing, and it's changing very fast. Uh, and that data that has accumulated through time there, which we're going to hear about tonight, uh, is so important to understanding the environmental impact of climate change. But basic questions, things like um, how rich and varied is life on Earth or in Australia or in the reef? You know, uh, what are, how are organisms distributed? Uh, which ones are common versus rare? Which ones are threatened with extinction? And how are these uh, species summing up into communities and how are they changing with time? Deceptively simple questions that are extremely hard to answer in reality and the work that Anne and Lyle do there, as you're going to hear about, um, is, uh, uh, is emblematic of the, of the role that we play at the Australian Museum through the Lizard Island Research Station in uh, achieving that kind of impact. So um, a pleasure to meet you all tonight. Thank you for the chance to join you and to help uh, host. And now I'm going to turn the floor over to the stars of the show here uh, from the reef. A pivotal moment of spawning on the reef uh, in, in these uh, days uh, just this dawn. And uh, we're going to hear about it from uh, Dr. Ann Hoggett and Dr. Lyle Vale, who you know uh, well, I'll turn the floor over to you and a presentation. Thank you, Ann and Lyle. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you, Chris, for the, uh, for the lovely introduction. Are you able to see the slide of beautiful Lizard Island there? Yeah? Okay. Well, it's a magnificent island and it's uh, 270 kilometres north of Cairns on the Great Barrier Reef. And like many other coral reefs worldwide, its reefs have suffered enormously over the past decade. 
We've had a crown of thorns starfish outbreak. We've had two destructive cyclones and three episodes of coral bleaching. But there's also been substantial recovery, as you'll see. Throughout all of that, scientists have been monitoring what's going on, trying to understand the consequences for this amazing ecosystem and working out ways to limit the damage. That management related work is based on a sound body of knowledge that's been developed over the years. The research station is a tiny drop in the ocean. Whoops. Sorry, I think I've mucked up here. <laughs> okay, okay, next slide. Sorry about that. Um, this is the research station, which is internationally important in this effort of documenting uh, life and processes on the coral reef. We provide everything that scientists need to work right on the reef, and in normal times, they come from all over the world to do so. The output of that research effort is scientific publications that document what's been learned so that other scientists can build upon it. There's almost 3,000 scientific publications based on work done at Lizard Island, which is an enormous contribution to knowledge. The pandemic has obviously affected the work of the research station this year. We had to close in March and reopened to limited capacity in August. So far, only Queenslanders have been able to get here due to border closures. The number of projects that we're facilitating is way down this year, less than half that of 2019. This is Kelly Hannon, one of the doctoral fellows whose work is supported by the Lizard Island Reef Research Foundation. She's studying the effects of ocean acidification on reef fishes. She was among the first to return after the closure, and she was desperate to do so because the final field trip of her PhD had been delayed by six months and she had deadlines looming. The Foundation's Fellowships and Grants Program provides a really important source of research funding for PhD students and early career researchers. Last year, we awarded 11 new ones to start this year, but due to COVID, five of them haven't even been able to start yet. There's also funded projects in their second and third years that are backing up because they just haven't been able to get here. Unfortunately, because of that, it just wasn't sensible to offer any new ones this year. And we truly hope that the program can return to normal next year. Education about reefs is also core business for the research station. And in a normal year, we host about 10 student groups, such as this one from RMIT University. Unfortunately, none of the groups that had planned to come this year could do so because of the pandemic. It included one very special group that we've been working to get here for quite some time. Thanks to some very generous donors and this foundation, we'd organised a funded trip for 16 high performing science students in year 11 at New South Wales government schools and two biology teachers who were all selected in a competitive process. They just about had their bags packed to come to Lizard Island when we had to cancel in late March for the trip that was about to start in early April. Disappointed doesn't even begin to describe the feelings. We do hope to be able to provide a great marine educational experience for these same students and teachers in 2021. And we sincerely thank the Kirby Foundation, the Corella Fund, Rowena Danziger and Ken Coles for making it possible. Quite surprisingly, at the last moment, one local school was able to have a Lizard Island experience this year. Nine kids in year 10 at a school in Cooktown were supposed to have gone to Canberra for an excursion last month, but that was impossible with the border closures. Instead, their very inventive science teacher arranged for a boat to bring them the 110 kilometres from Cooktown to Lizard Island collecting rubbish from beaches along the way and learning about the Lizard Island during their three days here at the research station. The Lizard Island Reef Research Foundation also provides the funding for most of our capital works and ongoing development of our solar power system is one example. The greatest single threat to coral reefs worldwide is rising sea temperatures, which can kill corals through bleaching. That's caused by carbon emissions and we need to reduce those urgently on a global scale to have any chance of retaining coral reefs as we know them into the future. At Lizard Island, our major source of carbon emissions comes from burning diesel to generate electricity. We used to use 41,000 litres of diesel per year. In 2011, we installed the solar power system that you're looking at here, which resulted in us producing about 65% of our electricity from renewable energy. 
but an exciting upgrade of the system is planned for early next year. It's, this will enable us to produce about 95% of our electricity from solar. We sincerely want to thank the Charles Warman and the Minaru Foundations for their generous support of this project. Now I'd like to update you on the state of the reef and some recent research highlights. Crown of thorns starfish, as you see here, they're huge. They impact the reef for two reasons. An individual adult starfish eats a prodigious amount of living coral and the numbers of starfish explode on a regular basis. We've had a half million dollar grant from the Ian Potter Foundation to help understand and mitigate the impact on the reef of these predators. We've now spent almost all of the money on 20 grants awarded over seven years, and we've learned some amazing things that will really make a difference. Scientific publications are the outputs of research, and these are the titles of the ones published to date from our Crown of Thorns grants program, and there's still more to come. Early on, one of our researchers developed a, cheap, a simple and cheap way of killing starfish by injecting them with household vinegar. And this is helping people to control outbreaks of the starfish in developing countries. We've also learned a lot about the larval and juvenile stages of the starfish. And it seems that these early life stages are critical to the development of outbreaks and also to detecting the timing and location of outbreaks, which of course impacts how you can mitigate the, those outbreaks. Crown of thorns larvae are tiny and transparent and they float around in the sea. The juveniles are also tiny. You can see one there in the slide on the right, tiny little thing between those calipers. And they hide away in nooks and crannies and they're really hard to find. We've trialled several different methods for detecting the larvae and juveniles, from divers with very good eyesight just looking for them, to trapping them, and to using environmental DNA to detect their presence in samples of seawater. All of this work puts us in a much better position to manage the next outbreak of starfish, which we predict will start in the Lizard Island area sometime between 2024 and 2027. Most research projects are planned for three years or less because of funding constraints. But when you're studying ecosystem processes, that's not really long enough. Really long-term studies on coral reefs are rare and very valuable. And our foundation is funding one of them, thanks to the Charles Warman Foundation. It's being conducted at Lizard Island by an international team whose leaders started out as PhD students at James Cook University nearly 20 years ago. They're interested in how corals build and sustain the coral reef environment that so many other animals and plants depend upon. They use underwater robots like you see here and also diver held rigs to photograph areas of reef in three dimensions, producing millimetre scale maps so that they can see change over time at many, many sites around Lizard Island. <clears throat> this is just one frame of thousands from one of their sites in 2018 when the reef was in a terrible state following cyclones and bleaching. There are no large corals to be seen at all, although there are some tiny ones if you look closely. If we fast forward by one year to the next time they surveyed this area, here's what it looks like. It's just an amazing recovery. Because this team comes from overseas, they haven't been able to do their surveys this year because of COVID, but they're planning to send some Sydney-based colleagues now that the border to Sydney people is open. Uh, they will come early next year to do these surveys again and keep this long-term record intact. Okay, this is, this is what the reef looks like now. Sorry, I got a bit ahead of myself there. <laughs> Um, yeah, because they haven't been able to, um, to do their normal records here, we've just got a photograph that Lyle and I took. So there, it's really rebounded hugely over the two years that's covered by those uh, three slides. Okay, they're not just looking at what's going on with the corals. They're measuring all sorts of other things too, like temperature, water currents, the size and shape of nooks and crannies, and the presence of other animals and plants. This long-term work is making strong contributions to ecological theory, and it's not only relevant to coral reefs, it's transferable to other environments like forests. The little terracotta tile in the inset is used to measure settlement of new corals following the annual coral spawning late in the year. The team sets out many of these tiles around the island every November, and then collects them in January to count how many coral larvae have settled onto that patch. Settlement of new corals was down to about 1% of 
of normal in the year following the massive bleaching of 2016, but it's been improving ever since. This part of the project, the settlement work, is continuing this year, thanks to colleagues based in Queensland who are doing the work for them. Well, the annual coral spawning is just incredible, and we've been privileged to see it many, many times. It happened here right on cue last weekend, and it was a beauty with many, many species doing it all on the same night. The little pink balls are bundles of eggs and sperm that pop out of the coral polyps and float up to the surface. There, the bundles break apart and the eggs become fertilised and develop into larvae that drift around in the sea for a few weeks before settling down onto the reef for good. And it's not just corals that spawn in this mass event. A whole heap of other animals also take part, such as this sea urchin, which spawned hundreds of eggs in one explosive burst on Saturday night. This is how reefs are able to recover from hideous damage. And the level of recovery that we've seen at Lizard Island in recent years is testament to the resilience of reefs. Unfortunately, the long-term prognosis is not so good, but it's in our hands to change it, and you guys are helping. Well, that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Anne, for the presentation. And, uh, so now we have the benefit of, of Anne and Lyle here. We also have Kate, of course, from the uh, uh, foundation here with us as well. So uh, ready to take some questions. I'll, I'll lead us off the bat here, Anne and Lyle. Um, so you know, when I hear about work on the reef and we see those pictures year by year, you know, it seems to me that working on the Great Barrier Reef can be a little bit of a roller coaster ride. There's the cyclones and bleaching and things look so dire uh, one year, but then things look a lot healthier around the corner. So, uh, you know, that's that's what you might see year on year, but the, the work that you have done over there uh, has been kind of unique in it allows you to see really long-term changes. So you're seeing year on year, but you're seeing the long-term trends. So, so many threats to be worried about. Warming seas, agricultural runoff, the crown of thorns, starfish. Tell us you know, how you rank the various threats and maybe what are the most important things that you've seen changing over your careers there? <laughs> okay, uh, sure. Well, we've, we've been here for 30 years and we've been, you know, experienced Lizard Island for, you know, several years before that as well. So it is a very, we do have a very long term view on the place. And I must say that up until 2014, um, things were pretty calm. We'd experienced a um, crown of thorns starfish outbreak in the 90s. And we watched the, you know, coral reef, um, you know, decrease in coral cover over that time. But then it came back again quite quickly. And then again, there was another one in the early 2010s. So that's our second coral uh, crown of thorns outbreak. But again, we thought, well, that's that's fine. This sort of is a bit normal and the reef can bounce back from that in, in normal times. But in 2014, when the first big cyclone hit, that was the first real blow where we saw massive damage on huge scale. And that was followed again 11 months later by another cyclone. And that really stripped the corals away all around the edge of the reef. And it was that was horrible enough. And then in 2016, we had this massive coral bleaching event because the, um, the, cor the corals in the lagoon were spared from the cyclones. And we thought, oh, well, at least we've still got those. But the bleaching got those corals in the lagoon. So it was pretty widespread disaster around the place. So um, yeah, that, that's it's up for the first 24 years that we were here, it was pretty, pretty straightforward but after that it's been one disaster after another um, but we are seeing the reef recover from these things but one wonders how long it can go on when these events come so quickly one after the other and even the crown of thorns events you know it's it's possible and indeed likely that crown of thorns have been outbreaking for you know a lot of history you know a lot of you know a very very long period of time and in normal circumstances the reef can bounce back from that but when all these other things are happening too, it's just too much for the ecosystem. So I'm, I'm very concerned for the future. But the biggest, biggest problem really is the um, warming temperatures uh, because that really affects the corals from growing and the corals are the foundation stone of the coral reefs. And if the corals aren't there, all the other organisms that live there can't live there either. So that's the most important one. We've uh, recently had another uh, very interesting perspective on the reef. Anne mentioned 
this local high school group that came, the Cooktown students, and they have spent a lot of time on the reef, uh, especially outside the reefs out of Cooktown, which are not protected. And then they came to Lizard, which is a highly protected area. And the, without exception, every student that came out of the water after their first snorkel, that there's so many fish here compared to the reef out of Cooktown. And that's only because it's property managed and protected area. So, you know, that's a very important aspect for the reef in the long term, that, that proper management. Thank you. Thank you both. So a, a, a trend has been accelerating of threats in the more recent years that you've been there. Um, but still, uh, the reef showing resilience when, when the conditions allow it to. Um, I, I wanted to step back and ask a, a fairly basic question that's been raised. Some people will know this well, but others are new to it. Um, you talk a lot about coral bleaching and the threats. Just explain to us briefly what, what coral bleaching is. Okay, well, well thanks. I, I've actually got some slides for this, which will help. So I'm going to share my screen again. I'll just go to the right slides Great. to begin with. Okay, so here's the screen again. Are you seeing that? Yeah. You're seeing my slides? Yeah. Okay, so this, this is the branch tip of, of a coral, and that's about as big as my finger. Um, so it's blown up a lot, and each of the little flowery bits that you see poking out of those tubes is the coral polyp. They're animals, and they need to, you know, get energy for themselves to, to grow and um, reproduce and things. And in normal circumstances, um, these corals have within their bodies uh, tiny microorganisms called zooxanthellae. And you can see these, I think, in the next slide. On the left, there's a ma much magnified view of a coral polyp with its tentacles there. And those little tiny brown dots that you see, they're the zooxanthellae that live within the corals. And they can photosynthesize. And so that's why you only find corals in clear, shallow water, because they need the photosynthetic products of these zooxanthellae to, for their nutrition. They get about 90, 90 to 95% of their nutrition from the sugars produced by these zooxanthellae. Now, it's a very finely balanced um, symbiotic relationship within the coral body to have these other organisms living there symbiotically within it. And when the biochemistry gets out of whack, um, the corals are actually able to expel these um, microorganisms. And they do that because when they, it starts to get too hot, the zooxanthellae go into overdrive and start producing too much oxygen. That's like having got what do you call them, free radicals running around in your body. They're not good for you. And the corals can sense that and they actually spit out the zooxanthellae. And when they spit them out, as you can see, it's partially done in the slide on the right. Um, it's a clear animal. The coral polyp is clear and it's the zooxanthellae that's giving it much of its colour. And so when, an an when a coral is beginning to bleach, it goes paler and paler until eventually it hasn't got any zooxanthellae left at all. And then it's a fully bleached coral. It's still alive but it's really not well because it's not getting 95% of its nutrition. So here are corals that are starting to bleach. Um, they're uh, pretty pink ones up at the top. Um, they're actually in a stage called fluorescence where they start to actually produce more um, proteins themselves as a sunscreen to protect themselves from the, the, um, the sun. And it's very costly to produce, so they can't keep that up for very long. So the ones right up the top and this one here at the front they're completely white. So they're still alive, but they, um, they're very sick and they're not going to last very long in that state. And then they move on and, uh, and die. So, and that's a, that's a fully bleached coral that's still alive. So I'll stop showing you what I'm seeing now. Um, so when, when that happens on a big scale, that is mass bleaching. And we have experienced three mass bleaching events around the world in the last five years. Now that's incredible because the first mass bleaching was only just only noticed in the 1980s. So this is something that is really picking up pace and it's really a big problem for coral reefs all around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I've got a question here in from um, Philippa, who says with the regrowth, in fact, that was a, a, a really heartening slide uh, that showed the uh, changes over the last uh, 12 months. With the regrowth that you're seeing, what type of diversity is there um, in the actual corals that are coming back 
um, compared to what was there beforehand. Um, you know, are there sort of winners and losers? Um, and also, uh, what about the fish um, species that you're seeing? Um, you know, is the, is the fish numbers dropped off, um, you know, appreciably as well? And are they coming back as well? Yeah, well, first about the, the coral diversity. It's, it's a hard question to answer because it's very difficult to identify corals. And this is, you know, one of the, this is what taxonomy does. It's trying to identify all things and, you know, separate the species and have names that you can hang on them. Uh, there's more than 400 hard coral species in this part of the Great Barrier Reef, and some of them are very, very different, difficult to tell apart from each other. Um, we do have surveys going on that are, people who are very, very good at identifying corals have been you know, re repeatedly going to the same place, including the project that I talked about before. And we're finding that almost all of the diversity is on its way back. Um, there may be some species that we haven't found yet, but I'd, I'd say a very large proportion of the coral species that were here before these disasters are still here now. And um, yeah, more are coming in all the time, I'm sure. Uh, in terms of the fish and other organisms, when the corals bleached big time in 2016, um, we did lose a lot of the tiny fishes. Uh, the little fish that live in the um, holes around coral and dart back into the coral when you swim over the top of them because that's their shelter. Um, a lot of those just died um, because they had no shelter. Some of them actually eat the coral polyps, so you know they lost their food source. But I think mostly it was the lack of shelter from um, their predators and things. Funnily enough, the average size of fish on the reef went up after these disasters because it was the little fish that disappeared and the big fish that were swimming around looking really fat and happy because they were able to get the little fish much more easily than, than beforehand. Mm -hmm. But we've been three years now without a major disaster and I've shown you the coral recovery. It seems that the fish populations are coming back as well. There's certainly lots of um, recruits um, coming in. This is the time of year when our researchers put out light traps to capture the tiny reef fishes that come back into the reef from the plankton to set um, and yeah, there, there's loads and loads of them coming back in now and there's lots and lots of species. So I'm very um, confident that the reef fishes are coming back as well as the corals. Thank you. A good reminder of how interconnected all aspects of life are in such a, a complex, complex ecosystem like the reef. Um, I want to change tact, tact a little bit. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we have, as many will know, uh, just had a major reopening event at the Australian Museum in Sydney uh, with uh, a full scale renovation after 15 months. But you too, uh, on Lizard Island, are undergoing various infrastructural changes and improvements. And can you tell us a little bit more about the um, solar and battery upgrades uh, going on there? Yeah, sure, certainly. Um, by the way, I can't wait to get down to Sydney and see that new museum. In fact, I've seen photos, but because of COVID, I haven't been able to get there. And it looks amazing. It uh, really looks special. What a job. Yeah, ours is a bit meager in, you know, in comparison, but it's and for us, we feel it's very important. Um, you know, as Anne said in her talk, we really wanted to reduce our uh, CO2 emissions. And we'll say the station is incredibly green. You know, we recycle everything we can. We have solar hot water entirely, and the list could go on and on. But the uh, the newest upgrade, of course, is our solar power system. And uh, the the new one is going to consist of, if you're a little bit interested in this stuff, about solar, 400 uh, solar panels, and that's about 99 kilowatts of uh, solar energy that we're going to get. The during the day uh, that drives the station and all the extra excess energy that we produce is going to be stored in lithium ferrophosphate batteries and that will keep us running during the night. So this new system is going to allow us to be virtually generator free for 330 days a year. It's only when we get intense clouds for many days in a row that probably the generators will come on and and keep us going for a little bit. So our CO2 emissions are going to, they're they are pretty low now, but they're going to really plummet after this. So we're super uh, excited about this new project. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm just going to read out a question here uh, from, from, um, from someone, I'm not sure who it is. Um, 
animal uh, plastics uh, in the oceans and microplastics on coral reefs are an, uh, an increasing problem. And I do know that the foundation and through our supporters um, uh, have given money for grants in this area. Can you perhaps talk a little bit about the sort of work that's being done in this area um, and how advanced is it and um, how much of a threat uh, to your regard uh, these microplastics? All right, I'm just going to share my screen again uh, for a moment. Um, this is a rather wonderful artwork that was put together um, recently by uh, Frederica Kroon, who has one of our um, microplastics grants, which were um, generously funded by, by several donors, including uh, the Banya family and um, the Rossi Foundation. So um, the most recent um, iteration of this, they, they came here to look at how microplastics were um, being concentrated in windrows in the sea because little fish larvae get concentrated in windrows and so does all the dust and stuff that lands on the surface of the sea. And of course, that's where the microplastics get um, concentrated too. So they were here just last week and they're coming here again tomorrow um, to finish this work. But while they were at it, they did a, um, a survey of one of our windward beaches. They did a 100 metre transect and picked up every piece of plastic that they found along that transect so in 100 metres, this is it. Everything in this picture was picked up on a 100 metre line, except the sheet that it's uh, sitting on. There were more than 2,500 pieces and they've just put together what I think is a rather beautiful thing, but uh, a bit sad as well. There's a, a PhD student at James Cook uh, University also working on uh, microplastics and she's uh, looking at where they're most commonly found. So she's taken samples from the the water column from the sediment, benthic animals like corals, and, you know, tunicates, and things like that. And her, uh, she's still working up her data, but uh, it looks like most of the micro or a lot of the microplastics are really found in the water column. And that's why Frederica's uh, project is, is so important here, looking at the wind rolling and effect that we get in the, the water column. Because a lot of the zooplankton and the little fish and that, they also go into these areas where the currents are sort of aggregates everything and uh, they have found that fish do ingest this stuff um, some of the fish they were watching uh, tended to pass it through their body after about eight hours but i suspect others not quite as efficient as some of those so it's it's sort of a watch this space uh, type of research because it's quite relatively new and uh, we've been amazed at the amount of support that people want to give for this uh, important research. Yeah. So we don't really know the effect of microplastics on marine organisms yet. I mean, it, it's been shown in temperate organisms, but it's a brand new field in the coral reef and it, it may not be the same at all. Um, of course, they, they may get to have toxicity from the, the plastic granules and just the sharp bits might damage their guts and things like that. And of course, plastic bags and turtles is well known to be a, a dreadful thing. Thank you. Um, I'll ask uh, one more question here that's uh, that's come in. Um, you know, the a good measure of the success of any scientific institution uh, has to be how well it's doing at training the next generation and supporting the next generation students and student researchers. And that's something that I. Um, you know, I really think of when I think of Lizard Island. And uh, I wondered if you might share any stories across a 30 year arc uh, of some of the uh, you know, students that have come, maybe who, who have you seen come young and come back and things like that. And also just remind us and speak to us about how um, the Lizard Island Research Reef, Reef Research Foundation supports that kind of work. Yeah, well, Lizard, <laughs> Lizard has an amazing history of people coming back and back and back, okay? And, and uh, I, I guess let's start at the back side. And the, the Lizard Island Reef Research Foundation provides these, you know, really sought after fellowships. And every year we advertise doctoral and postdoctoral fellowships, and we get amazing quality of uh, fellowship applications. It's quite a selection process. And the fellows that, uh, Get them. They, it's it's you know it really helps them on their career. I believe they do some amazing work here. It covers all aspects um, from fish to corals to reef metabolism, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's it's a highly successful uh, 
uh, fellowship program. And uh, we've had students that come here as doctoral fellows, then they go on to get a position at a university, often go on and do their postdocs all the time, producing papers and that along the way. And then they might get a, a permanent position at a research institute or a university, and they bring their students back to us here. So uh, we've known some of these people for as long as we've been here. Um, so it's a great relationship that way. And uh, we're very supportive of this fellowship program and, and uh, appreciative of all the donors and that that, that uh, fund it. Um, it was interesting, in the early days, uh, when we first came, we actually had a little bit of a hard time raising money for it. But over the last 15 to 20 years, it's just exploded. And uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. We intend to keep it up for as long as we can. And the benefit to the students who get the fellowships is enormous because field money is, is difficult to come by. And that's what the fellowship covers. It gives them the, the travel money to enable them to come into the field at Lizard Island for extended periods of time. And that's that's very, very valuable time for a scientist, that field time. And the money to do it is, is hard to come by. So they, they become um, independent of their supervisors. They don't have to go to their supervisors for the field money and that makes them more independent and we, we see them blossom when they come here and even you know apart from the fellowships the on a more prosaic sort of thing Lizard Island is really a place where people are mentored carefully not necessarily by Lyle and I but by each other because we've got the whole range of people from you know, professors down to honours students who come here to do research and they learn from each other they talk to each other in a really comfortable and friendly environment and they, they learn you know, they, people can come here with a boat license, a newly minted boat license, but they really haven't got a clue about how to drive a boat. But other people here will go out with them and train them and help them until they're, they're confident to use a boat alone. So it's a really important training ground. And uh, Lyle was talking about two generations of doctoral fellows. We've actually had three. We've, we've had doctoral fellows who've become professors, who have students, who become doctoral fellows, and then they have students who become doctoral fellows. So it's uh, it's a you know, it's, it's a very, very long-term and continuous process. The circle of life on the reefs there, that's uh, remarkable. <laughs> that has to be one of the most rewarding aspects, I would think, of 30 years on the reef is seeing that progression. Of it is, it's great, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I might turn things back to Kate. Good, well, I think if, um, is that all the questions we've, I, I, we've got? I think yeah. So, yeah, okay, I've just actually got one for Chris, which um, which I'll just start uh, turn back before we before we wrap up. Um, Chris, who is a mammologist, in fact, someone I uh, heard him uh, describe him the other day that he uh, speaks to mammal, but um, I understand there are over 100 um, marine mammals, and um, I just wondered if you could perhaps just Touch upon uh, your observations as a mammologist, what you're seeing changes um, in the marine world of mammals, um, obviously because there's great synergy about uh, yeah. what goes on and, and, and not only terrestrial, but um, in, the, in the oceans as well. Great question. I mean, um, exactly. Just like reefs, I mean, ocean going mammals, including the biggest animals that ever lived, the great whales, are just these, you know, symbols of. Uh, the vastness and the wildness of the ocean. But like reefs, we can make a long list of all the kind of challenges and insults that the modern world has delivered to the marine environment and that, you know, um, ocean going mammals have to feel the brunt of. You said, you know, there's more than 100 uh, marine mammals. That's right. That's things like seals, sea lions, uh, dolphins, and, and whales, and also you know, dugongs, manatees. So many of these are, most of these are big animals. They live long lives and they breathe slowly, usually just one calf at a time. And so um, if they're being affected by um, any different kinds of insult, it can have a big impact on population. So mm -hmm. ocean pollution, including plastics, as we've heard about, you know, and Anne and Lyle mentioned, you know, the impact on marine turtles. Uh, when we find and have a chance to do an autopsy, a necropsy on a marine mammal that walks up, washes up on a beach, for example, um, it's inevitable now that we find that there's plastic inside the body. And uh, that may or may not be the cause of death. A very common cause of death is entanglement mm -hmm. of a, a beautiful, incredible animal like a whale in, um, you know, fishing 
fishing equipment that is so strong to be able to stay in the ocean for decades that a whale's body just can't deal with it. So, so many um, impacts on, on marine mammals and the shipping traffic is another issue. At the same time, the, like perhaps some aspects of the reef, there's room for some optimism too, because uh, when I think of whales too, I think that how the whole world got their act together and came together just a few decades ago and said, we are not going to hunt these animals anymore. We are not going to have an industrial whaling industry. And that shows us that something that has gone on for centuries, an environmental impact like whaling, um, can be overcome just in a single generation when parties governments come together and make some hard decisions about how they're going to manage some aspect of the environment that gives me some hope for you know what the path forward will really be um, in trying to address carbon and warming oceans as uh, Anne and Lyle have talked about too the only real way to do that the only way for optimism is to imagine that we finally get our act together as a set of global governments and make the changes that are necessary. So thanks for that question. No, no, it's all, it's all, it's all intertwined. Um, well, look, I, th I think we're nearly, um, we're nearly at our 45 minutes. So um, I'd really like to thank you all for tuning in this evening. Thank you for your questions. Um, thank you, Anne and Lyle and Chris, of course. Uh, but most of all, um, without the support of you, our donors, uh, our supporters, all the interested parties, um, the work of the foundation could not happen. Uh, it's it's um, so important. Um, really, uh, we all care. We're all here because we care. We're all here because we're concerned about the reef, about all the threats, and uh, we need the science, we need the scientists, uh, because without uh, the work that they do, we don't know really how to uh, how to address these problems. And I think um, it's terrific that uh, there's some optimism, Anne um, and Lyle are seeing the, some regeneration there. Um, our fingers crossed. I don't know what the what the long-term forecast is uh, for, for this summer, and what does uh, and Lyle, what does the, what does the bomb mean? say well it, it seems to be um, one thing or the other really it's a if it's a um it's either going to be a hot dry summer or a cooler wet summer and with the la nina that we've got forecast for this summer it's looking like it's going to be a, a wetter summer that means we're more at risk from cyclones uh, what i didn't mention before was of course reefs are always subject to cyclones but they they have a limited impact in area you know, they, they may have a swathe of some, you know, tens or a hundred kilometres, but the reef is very big and so it, it's a bit patchy, the cyclone's um, impact on the reef. But when we have, in these warmer days, the cyclones are becoming more ferocious. Um, so we have about the same number of cyclones, but the cyclones we get are stronger. And as we have seen here, now a little cyclone, category one, category two, yes, it breaks off a few corals, but it's not a big deal. The reef can recover from that quite quickly. If you get category four and category five cyclones, that is much, much more damaging and takes a lot longer to recover from those cyclones. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. So we're hoping that this year, we don't have any cyclones in this area. There will certainly be cyclones in Queensland. Um, I'm pleased to say that we now have a cyclone shelter which um, was built a couple of years ago following our two big cyclones. So that will certainly affect our response to any big cyclone that comes here. But uh, we hope it's like the umbrella. You know, you take an umbrella, it's not going to rain. So <laughs> let's, let's hope we don't get one this year. Kate, the, uh, the water temperature now is about typical for this time of year, but I did look uh, forward a bit on the NOAA uh, website, and they are predicting like alert level one for mid-February, and then possibly alert level two, which is real bad for mid-March. So um, hopefully we'll get some uh, cooperative weather conditions, cloudy skies, rain, even a cyclone that comes sort of near and drops a lot of rain, but not much wind and uh, might help save us a bit. So fingers crossed that we'll get through yeah. another summer. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you um, uh, for, for all your questions. Thank you for your interaction. And uh, thank you most of all for your support. Uh, for those who uh, haven't supported and may care to, you'll find out how on our website. But um, uh, uh, without you all, none of this work could, could uh, could be done or could continue. So we're really, really thrilled to have you um, this evening. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Oh, thank you, Kate. It's a, a pleasure to uh, 
uh, be here tonight with so many of you who have come here to uh, support or think about ways you can support the work that's going on here. So thank you, Kate, for the work that you do in bringing us all together and all the support that that brings uh, to the reef and to Anne and Lyle there at Lizard Island. Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good night, everybody. Good Thanks. evening, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, Anne. Bye, Lyle. Bye-bye. <laughs>